All right. We're at ventricular rhythms now. So we will talk about ventricular rhythms and how they kind of build off of what we talked about with junction rhythms. You'll see there's a couple of commonalities between junction rhythms and ventricular rhythms. <clears throat> and then we'll start understanding that ventricular rhythms are the end of the line. This is, this is where the heart is doing everything it can to not be in cardiac standstill and into cardiac arrest. So let's share screen and move on to ventricular rhythms. Okay, so with ventricular rhythms, uh, here's what we have. Uh, first of all, the, the, the pacer is um, past the bifurcation of the, of the bundle of his, okay? So in other words, it's either down in the bundle branches or in the, or some area of the ventricular contractile cells. Uh, we are moving cell to cell. So we are not, uh, we are no longer using the autorhythmic system, which means we're not going through the Purkinje system that allows the ventricular contractile cells to all contract relatively simultaneously. Um, we are now having to depolarize through the contractile cells in a cell to cell through the gap junctions. The two ventricles are no longer synchronous. In other words, uh, we're going cell to cell throughout the entirety of the, of the ventricles, which means uh, it's going cell to cell through one vent ventricle and on into the other other ones. So they're not, they're no longer synchronized. Uh, the QRS complexes therefore will be wide. They'll be greater than or equal to 0.12. And we often have some really bizarre ST and T wave abnormalities because of it as well. Um, the repolarization process is not going to be unified because the depolarization process is not unified. So uh, the depolarization wave again is going cell to cell. <clears throat> The shape of the uh, wave, the morphology of the wave is gonna be dependent on where the actual uh, pacemaker site begins. Sometimes we'll see uh, a combination of one, almost one looking sinus wave as you see here on the upper left, uh, where you have the R wave and the T wave. Um, you might have something in, the, in its reverse, depends on what lead you're looking in. You might have something like this that kind of shows one ventricle and then the other, or here one ventricle and then the other, um, or here one ventricle and then the other. So there's a number of different ways that you might see it and the morphology is gonna be dependent on where the actual uh, ectopic pacing site has, has initiated from. Um, when measuring the QRS complex, uh, you'll just have to kind of figure out where the, um, uh, where the actual um, beginning and ending is. And then remember that because it's all funky in terms of the way the depolarization process is happening, it's possible that part of the depolarization is happening uh, in, in a um, perpendic perpendicular fashion to a lead that you're looking in. If it is perpendicular to the lead that you're looking in, if it's at a right angle there, uh, then it might come out as uh, something that you don't see at all. So what you're seeing here, um, what we see here in this cartoon is the QRS complex in V1 and the QRS complex in lead two in this example. And it looks like the V1 QRS complex is wide, but it looks like the lead two QRS complex is narrow. Uh, and the thing is, is that if you have, if, if it's consistent, if, if your complexes are consistent all the way through, so we're not talking about a premature or a skate beat in any way, um, the QRS complexes have to be the same. So if we look at uh, V1 compared to lead two together, what you notice is the first part of lead of V1 is not present in the lead two version. Uh, and so the measurement in lead two might be off a little bit. This is the benefit of a 12 lead, right? So whatever the widest QRS complex, whatever lead is showing you the widest QRS complex, um, that's, the, that's the measurement that you're, that you're going with. Uh, realize that the ventricular pacemaker is it. If, if the ventricular pacemaker goes out, whatever this pacemaker is, then there isn't another backup system. This is the backup system. So. Um, 
the P wave, uh, there might be P waves in ventricular rhythms and they could be completely disassociated. So like for example, ventricular tachycardia could be a form of, of have a, a component of AV disassociation with it. So the P wave might be present. It just kind of depends on whether or not there's a block in the AV node in addition to everything else. But if there's a, a pacemaker site in the ventricles, then you might have a series of retrograde P waves that are also found uh, within the system, or you might have uh, a complete disassociation where you see P wave activity on top of ventricular activity. Um, normal P waves can conduct, but they just can fail to capture the ventricles because the ventricles might be on their own um, set of, of uh, firing uh, and retrograde P waves are, well, if we, if we have them, they'll be inverted and leads to three and AVF uh, and you'll have a very long RP interval uh, in those cases. Uh, they can also be buried inside the QS complex or they can be right before it. Uh, it just kind of depends on where the pacemaker site in the ventricles actually is to begin with. So be looking for those P waves all over. That this does create some potential confusion with some of the other rhythms we've looked at, AVNRT and AVRT. Um, so just keep that in mind. There, there is some work that we have to do to kind of tell exactly what some of these rhythms are. Um, so here you're looking at the, the top cartoon is, is what might be happening in the atria. The middle cartoon, the red cartoon is what might be happening in the ventricles and then the compilation that you see down at the bottom and you see that that might be a, an AV disassociation or a third degree block um, moving into this as well. Um, it, sometimes it's kind of difficult to see the difference between a ventricular rhythm or a supraventricular rhythm that has an aberrancy like a bundle branch block. So there's a couple of things that you can look at. You can look at Joseph, Josephson's sign or Brigada's signs. Um, those are those show up in ventricular rhythms only. They do not show up in supraventricular rhythms. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. The, the absence of these signs does not mean that it is not ventricular. But there, so there is some discrepancy there. But the presence of them does mean that it is ventricular. So if you see these, then you know that it's ventricular and not supraventricular with aberrancy. So Josephson's sign is a little notch that we see when you see the downstroke of, of an S wave. Um, so even if you see an R wave and then it goes into the, the S wave after it, you might see that notch. So just look for one of the leads that shows you uh, a deep S wave or a QS wave. And if you see that notch, then you'll note that that is ventricular. And Brigada's sign is a timing. So from the start of the QRS complex to the nadir of the S wave. That means the start of the QRS complex, no matter where the QRS complex starts, to the bottom point of the S wave uh, that might be present. Uh, if that distance is at least 0 0.10 seconds, uh, then that is also ventricular in, in nature. If it is, um, if it is, uh, shorter than 0 0.10 second, then we would argue that it could be a supraventricular with an aberrancy. But if it is um, 0.110 seconds, uh, then we would say that it is ventricular. Uh, much like we had with the ventricular rhythm, or the, I'm sorry, the junctional rhythms where we had junctional, accelerated junctional, and junctional attack, we have that similar situation with, with the general idea of ventricular rhythms. So the ventricles will typically fire at about 20 to 40 beats per minute. So if we have a ventricular rhythm, you would fire at 20 to 40 beats per minute in its, in its normal firing rate. Uh, so that would be a ventricular escape rhythm, or we sometimes refer to that as idioventricular. So ventricular escape or idioventricular mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. If it's going more than 40 beats per minute, but under 100, we call it accelerated idioventricular. And if it's going greater than 100, uh, then it'll either be a ventricular tachycardia or a ventricular flutter. Uh, and then when we get into V-fib, we're talking about something that we cannot discern a rate because we have no QS complexes.
So something to keep in mind here, um, all ventricular rhythms except for V-fib and ventricular standstill. Um, ventricular standstill would, another, would be another name for asystole, though sometimes we have uh, the ventricles being asystolic but not the atria, so sometimes you can see some P wave activity but not QRSs. It's just as bad as asystole, but we call that ventricular standstill. Asystole is a form of ventricular standstill. So all ventricular rhythms except V-fib and ventricular standstill have what kind of a QRS complex? And the answer there, if you haven't already said it to yourself, is they have a wide QRS complex. Um, if the rhythm has a narrow QRS complex, it cannot be ventricular. Let me say that again. If the rhythm has a narrow QRS complex, it cannot be ventricular. It must be superventricular, which, is, which means it's either a sinus rhythm, an atrial rhythm, or a junctional rhythm. Um, however, however, if you have a wide QRS, it doesn't necessarily mean it's ventricular. If you have a wide QRS, then it is either ventricular or supraventricular with an aberrancy. But if it's a narrow QRS complex, it is supraventricular. It cannot be ventricular. Hopefully that made sense. Um, okay, so our first little foray into our ventricular rhythms would be a, a, a PVC. So just like we had a PAC and a PJC, we also have PVCs. Uh, PVCs here uh, are uh, areas of excitability in the ventricles that end up firing off a QRS complex. Um, recall that we that the difference in our uh, PVCs and PJCs with an aberrancy has to do with the um, starting portion of this premature beat. Uh, in this particular cartoon that you see here, you note that we that it's clearly a PVC and not a PJC because we have a slight little Q wave. So the initial por portion of this QRS complex goes down and this one it, um, immediately goes up. Uh, so this is clearly a PVC. There's no question about that. And it came in, it's a QRS complex that came in early uh, and there is no uh, P wave tucked into this T wave. So we know that there's no P wave causing this. So we, we know that there is no aberrancy present. Here. So this is a PVC. Um, whether or not there's a compensatory pause, again, follow our guidelines that we used before. Um, oftentimes, there, um, there is a compensatory pause because this may not have gotten control over the SA node and often does not. So. Um, PVCs originate from some sort of a ventricular focus. They come prematurely and the, Q, the QRS complex of the PVC is going to be 0.12 seconds or wider usually with some sort of a bizarre morphology because as you're going cell to cell within the, the ventricles, you get that weird um, sine wave-ish morphology. ST segments and T-wave abnormalities are, are quite common. Um, and these are usually associated with compensatory pauses, but either can, can, can occur. So I made that statement in the, in the, when we talked about PJCs saying PJCs are often associate, associated with non-compensatory pauses. That's because the PJC often depolarizes the SA node also, which causes the SA node to be non-compensated when it comes back in. Um, PVCs often are compensatory uh, because when the PVC fires, it often does not get all the way through the AV node and into the atria and therefore does not get control of the SA node. Um, because of the delay that it has to go through through the junction. So PVCs are often compensatory, whereas PJCs are often non-compensatory. So again, here's a, a PVC cartoon. <clears throat> uh, anytime we have PVCs that come from the same focus, uh, they often uh, follow some sort of a coupling in, uh, interval. So that means that you might have so many normal QRS complexes followed by a PVC, followed by the same number of um, normal QRS complexes followed by a PVC. Um, and when we talk about the coupling uh, interval, we're talking about when you see PVCs that come from the same focus, 
they tend to be stimulated in a in a in the same time frame from the previous QS complex. So in this case, we have a normal QS complex followed by PVC, and over here we have a normal QS complex followed by PVC. These two PVCs are coming from the same focus, and because they're coming from the same focus, they often will be coupled with this previous QS complex in the same distance. So the the R to R interval from the good QS complex to the PVC is often the same as the R to R interval from the good uh, QS complex to the PVC of the subsequent uh, PVC cycles. Uh, sometimes we'll have what's called an R on T phenomena that can occur uh, where we will have a PVC that jumps on top of, of a T wave of the previous QRS complex, um, and we'll have what's called an R on T uh, PVC. So on the R on T phenomenon that we have here, there's some uh, potential problems that could arise here. If you remember back to some of the talk that we had related to um, anytime you have an R on top of a T or defibrillating on top of a T, like with cardioversion, it can lead to some potential problems, some reentry problems, or some other circular issues that could lead to some detrimental effects with the patient. So it is something to note and something to watch anytime you have PVCs that are, that are potentially falling on top of an R wave. Um, in diastolic PVCs are PVCs that happen uh, tucked in really close to a, a P wave. So sometimes it, they, just, they just happen to fall in such a way that makes them look like they're coming from a P wave. There isn't any clinical importance here other than the fact that sometimes they can be misdiagnosed as a PAC with an aberrancy, when in fact it's really just a PVC that happens to be falling uh, uh, coincidentally after a P wave of the, of the previous uh, sinus uh, node firing. Remember though that this, if this were an aberrancy rather than a PVC, if this were an aberrantly conducted QRS, then you would have the same starting here uh, of, this, uh, of this wide QRS complex that we have from the previous normal QRS complex. So if you do see it going completely in the opposite direction, it absolutely is not an aberrant. Um, supraventricular QRS complex, but instead is a ventricular PVC. Um, unifocal PVCs are, P are PVCs that always come from the same point and they'll all have the same morphology. And multifocal PVCs are ones that come from different areas. Um, it's just important to note if your PVCs always look the same or if they are different. Uh, if they're different, it lets us know there's not just one area of the heart that is becoming excitable for some reason, but there are several areas of the ventricles that are doing that. And then when we talk about recurrent PVCs, we can name them. So if we have a PVC after every other normal QRS complex, so it's kind of a one-to-one -one scale of normal QRS complexes to PVCs, then we call that bigeminal. If it's every third QRS complex is a PVC, we call it trigeminal. And if it's every fourth QRS complex, we call it quadrigeminal. Uh, we don't go above that. Uh, we would just say frequent P PVCs after that. We also might have them um, put together in some fashion. So if we have two PVCs in a row, we would call it a couplet of PVCs. If we have three of them in a row, we would call it a triplet of PVCs. And typically if we have four or more in a row, we would say we have a run of VTAP. Uh, and sometimes they can be unifocal or multifocal triplets, and it just kind of depends again on what is being excited in the ventricles. An interpolated PVC doesn't have uh, any added clinical significance, but it is just an anomaly to note, and that is sometimes you can have a PVC that happens to fire so in between uh, two normal firings of the SA node that it, that it doesn't disrupt anything uh, in the atria or the ventricles. Uh, and it's just this PVC that happens to fall exactly in between two QRS complexes, um, two cardiac cycles that are normal. This happens in some slower rhythms. Uh, again, it doesn't have any added clinical uh, 
concern other than to just note that it's an oddity that happens with PVCs from time to time. And again, all of the same things that caused PACs and PJCs can lead to PVCs as well. And here we're looking at some sinus rhythms with PVCs that happen to be within them. And here we have some multifocal PVCs on the top tracing and some unifocal and a unifocal couplet on the bottom tracing. This top tracing is by Gemini, where we have again normal QS followed by PVC in a repeated in a repeated fashion, and the bottom one where it's every third. Uh, our ventricular escape rhythm, uh, escape beats, sorry, when we talk about ventricular escape, we can have a ventricular escape beat, just like we had a junctional escape beat. And that is just a single beat that comes after it was supposed to be. Uh, it is typically associated with a non-compensatory pause. So for example, if uh, we had a sinus block or a sinus pause or something that caused the sinus node to stop, but also affected the AV node and the atria, uh, then it could be that the ventricle is the thing that takes over to try to prevent cardiac standstill. And when that happens, it looks like we have a beat that is similar to that of a PVC, but because it is coming after the time frame of a QRS complex that was supposed to be there, uh, we call it an escape beat. And it, again, is the ventricles trying to fire so that we don't have uh, so that we don't have ventricular standstill. If whatever was happening in the atria was corrected though, or transient, uh, then that escape beat might not get a hold of everything. The SA node or the atria get a hold of everything again, and our, and we move on to a normal rhythm or a regular rhythm after that that isn't ventricular in nature. Then we just call it an escape beat. Um, that escape complex again comes after the time frame of when a, when a QRS was supposed to have fired. Uh, and again, the morphology will be typical of any other ventricular complex. So it'll be wide and bizarre. So very similar to the PVCs, but it comes late. Uh, it can occur uh, in multiples. So for example, if you have uh, a non-conducted P wave that then creates uh, a ventricular escape happening, um, but that if that ventricular escape does not get control over the SA node, then what you end up having is the atria fires, something dropped the QS complex, so then a, ventri a ventricular escape focus fires, but it didn't do anything to the atria, so the atria fires again on its own, but it doesn't have a corresponding QS complex there either because the ventricles are still in their refractory period from the previous escape beat. Um, and then uh, maybe you have another escape beat that happens because they're finally ready to fire. Uh, so they fire, but it doesn't do anything to the, uh, to the atria still. And then eventually the timing gets back to where the atria gets control over it and we move forward with a normal rhythm. So it's possible that it occurs in multiples sometimes. Um, and you see the P waves marching through the entire time. So if we have three escape complexes that occur in a row, we would call it uh, an idioventricular rhythm, even if it's within another rhythm. So we might say, uh, if we had three of them in a row, we would say we have maybe a sinus rhythm that converted to an idioventricular rhythm that converted back to a sinus rhythm. If our escape beat turns into a rhythm, then we have an idioventricular rhythm or a ventricular escape rhythm. You can use either of those monikers for it, either of, the, either of those phrases to, uh, to describe this rhythm. Uh, if it's an idioventricular rhythm, it should be firing at 20 to 40 beats per minute. This is the intrinsic firing of the ventricles, which is the 20 to 40 beats per minute. Uh, and Sometimes it can develop just because the SA node is starting to fire too slow to really get capture and the ventricles finally fire off on their own. Uh, and you'll, you'll see kind of a normal ventricular morphology for the complexes, which are wide and bizarre, but consistent. 
Um, so wide, bizarre beats that are consistent. Uh, it can be a little challenging to figure out what is the T wave sometimes in these rhythms. Um, so just, just be aware you're going to have to get used to trying to see different morphologies and start identifying where T waves are. Sometimes it's helpful, again, to see the 12 leads so you can see T waves more clearly in one lead versus another. So you can get the timing of when the T wave, T wave happens. It is common in idioventricular rhythms to have a, an associated AV disassociation. So it's, it's common to see in an idioventricular rhythm the P waves. Um, and so we can have a third degree block or other AV disassociation with this. Um, and it's common that in complete heart, block, heart blocks, the ventricular return is idioventricular in nature. If it's, you have an idioventricular rhythm that's going faster than 40 beats per minute, then we will have an accelerated idioventricular rhythm. Um, anytime we have the, the idioventricular rhythm speeding up for whatever reason, but it's less than 100, we call it accelerated idioventricular, and that's due to whatever is causing an increased automaticity, um, whether that be uh, sympathetic or we have some other uh, influence that is causing the ventricles to, to feed up. Uh, they will have a typical ventricular morphology, and that means kind of wide and bizarre, but consistent. And they tend to be very regular, uh, except for the start. The start of rhythms are often not completely regular, but once you get into the rhythm, it tends to be regular. Um, these rhythms are rhythms that need to continue. Uh, we either need something better um, or we need this to be this to, to be there, but this is what's causing the heart to not go into ventricular standstill. So you would not try to shock a rhythm like this or get rid of this rhythm. Um, in fact, you'd want this rhythm to in increase or to uh, convert to something better. Do not slow these rhythms down, this rhythm down. So an accelerated idioventricular rhythm. <clears throat> Sometimes again, you can have uh, a disassociation with it, an AV disassociation. So you will often see P waves mixed into these rhythms. Capture beats are a situation during AV disassociation when the atria actually does ca capture the ventricles for a moment. So sometimes in AV disassociation, it's not because of a, of a total block. Um, and so sometimes you'll have a, a narrow what looks like a normal QRS complex mixed into uh, an idioventricular beat where the, the atria actually got a momentary capture of the ventricles uh, and everything is conducted down the normal conduction pathway. Uh, so this changes the morphologic appearance of those ventricular rhythms. So again, you have this uh, AV disassociation going on with, with a ventricular escape happening. And then all of a sudden, one of the uh, atrial depolarizations captures the AV node and captures the ventricles, and we see a normal QRS complex, and then it some and then it'll move back into the uh, to the wide complex idioventricular rhythm underneath it, and that's called a capture beat. Um, and then sometimes we have fusion complexes, which start to get formed when we get kind of a, a partial capture from a supraventricular pacemaker. Um, that fuses with a complex that's formed by an ectopic ventricular pacemaking site. And so we sometimes get complexes that look like both. So what we have here uh, is we have, you know, the start of the QRS complex uh, can look somewhat normal uh, and the tail end of it uh, is not because it's coming from two different pacemaking sites that, that get this. So you have complexes that look partially normal and partially um, bizarre. We call those fusion complexes. All right. So when you're looking at this strip, what you see is you see a PDP interval that goes all the way through with fusion beats at the beginning, right? So you have the P wave causing the, the QRS complex here. 
and it's leading into the start of a, of a normal QRS complex, but it also looks a little bit bizarre because there is a ventricular pacemaker that's firing independently as well. So these, these are fused beats that we have here that have some P activity that's leading to some of the ventricular depolarization, but also we have uh, some, an ectopic focus in the ventricles that are also uh, producing some of the, the, the morphology. Here we have a complete capture beat. And then over here, because our P wave is coming at the back end and is not associated with anything, these are all ventricular morphologies all the way through. Um, so you just might have some interactions between uh, P waves that are getting some capture, P waves that are getting complete capture, and then uh, P waves that have nothing to do with the ventricular activity at all. Um, so these uh, rhythms here are typically caused by bad things most of the time. Okay. Um, idioventricular, rhythm, uh, idioventricular rhythms have that increased automaticity uh, because of some sort of an escape mechanism that is uh, not getting capture from the supraventricular pacemakers. The supraventricular pacemakers have failed. And so now we have the, the ventricles that are trying to do their job um, and trying to take care of, of not letting the heart go into this ventricular standstill that would obviously be the complete demise of the organism, in this case, a person. Um, ventricular tachycardia is a tachycardia that typically goes from about 100 to up to maybe 200 beats per minute um, with a wide complex uh, tachycardia. Uh, anytime we have, um, well, more than three ectopic ventricular complexes in a row, um, that are moving faster than 100 beats per minute, we would say there's a run of VTAC. So anything above a triplet. Um, it's possible that the rates are a little bit higher, um, but we would have to start thinking of other things as well. Um, but 100 to 200 beats per minute is typical for VTAC. Um, all the complexes will have identical morphologies uh, in monomorphic VTAC and in polymorphic VTAC, you'll have morphologies that will change from beat to beat. And I'll show both of those in just a minute. Um, no matter what, anytime you see a wide complex tachycardia, assume it's ventricular tachycardia until you prove otherwise. So do not assume that it is supraventricular with an aberrancy. Um, it's possible that it's supraventricular with an aberrancy, but uh, VTAC is the worst it can be in these wide complex tachycardias. So assume that first, and then we'll work backwards from there. Um, anytime we have a VTAC that is less than 30 seconds in duration, so a run of VTAC that is less than 30 seconds, we say it's a non-sustained VTAC. Anything more than 30 seconds is a sustained VTAC. Um, and, or, or if you have a VTAC that keeps coming back that requires some sort of intervention to break, we would say it's a sustained VTAC. And incessant VTAC is one that's persist persistent most of the time, regardless of what, um, what is being done for them. Good, so sustained VTAC lasts longer than 30 seconds. Or if it was under 30 seconds, but we did an intervention to break it, then we would call it sustained as well. Reentry mechanisms with VTAC, um, <coughs> pardon me. One, if there is an electrical current with two pathways, so WPW or an accessory bypass track, um, the two pathways will have different underlying properties uh, with the area of slowing that is in one circuit can create a reentry re mechanism, um, similar to what we've already talked about in the past with uh, AVRT. Uh, and once we, we have that, if we have at least these two pathways, um, then we can, it can kind of create a problem. So infarcts uh, and such, this is, this is not, I don't mean a, a, a pathway between the atria and the ventricles like WPW. Just remember our talk. I've talked about this several times right now. Um, this would be in an area that might have some dead tissue or something that creates 
it's a, a different bridge or a pathway um, with scar tissue or something that kind of creates uh, another little electrical circuit that, that can kind of create this. So uh, if we have kind of an area of dead tissue, then there, there can be an area um, that has this secondary circuit that can be created and some of these circular pathways that we've talked about in the past, um, we talked about it with a flutter, we've talked about it with um, AVNRT, we've talked about it with AVRT, that can happen within the ventricles themselves as, as well. So once we have a little pathway that is like that, uh, then we now have a fast pathway and a slow pathway, and we can create some sort of a circular motion within the ventricles that creates a tachycardia, okay? Uh, normal tissue has more gap junctions within them, so it can depolarize faster than this tissue that is uh, not as viable because it has a bunch of dead tissue around it, and so that ends up being a slower pathway, and that, that is how we can have uh, kind of this, this two-cycle look at it. Again, one pathway fast, one pathway slow, and it looks much like many of the circuits that I've shown you before. Um, VTAC tends to be very wide and has these bizarre complexes. They are greater than or equal to 0.12 seconds. They may or may not have a left bundle branch or right bundle branch configuration. We'll talk about those when we get into the 12 lead talk next term. Um, ST and T wave abnormalities are normal. Uh, Josephson sign or Brigada's sign are possible and you should look for them to rule out supraventricular activity uh, because any superventricular activity with aberrancies will not have either Josephson's or Brigada's sign. Uh, the, tip, the, the rhythm is, is typically regular and often can be triggered by a PVC. So looking here, you can see many different morphologies that all can be monomorphic VTAC. And then again, often it can be triggered by a PVC, especially if a PVC is triggered in somebody that has some cardiac disease already. In about 50% of our, our VTAC, we can have an AV disassociation with it as well. Um, so if you see uh, atrial uh, activity on top of ventricular activity, that, that tells us that it's there. Um, if you don't see the P waves in there, but you do see some capture or fusion beats from time to time, then that also tells us that there is an under, underlying AV, uh, atrial activity, which lets us know that there is AV disassociation happening. Um, any wide complex tachycardia with AV disassociation or without AV disassociation should be considered VTAC until proven otherwise. So assume VTAC with these wide complex tachycardias. Uh, but here you see some evidence of P waves um, and some capture beats in the mix. So it lets us know that, that there really is AV disassociation going on. Um, oftentimes you're gonna have the, the precordial leads. And again, we'll talk about this with 12 lead, but you get the precordial leads that'll either be all positive or all negative. Um, and the axial direction really has to do um, with um, uh, what's happening within the VTAC and where the pacemaker site uh, happens to be. And we often get um, a right axis deviation when we have this. And we'll talk about that when we talk about um, some of the, the 12 lead activities. So don't get too hung up on it just yet, but just know that it's gonna come back and we'll have to discuss axis and what happens with, with VTAC versus some of the other rhythms that we see. There's a non-sustained monomorphic VTAC that you hear that was precipitated by a PVC. Um, and then we can see something called ventricular flutter. Ventricular flutter uh, fires at about 200 to 300 beats per minute. So it's, it's a very 
fast activity uh, in, the, in the ventricles. Um, VTAC, where the morphology of the various components of the complex are blurred, let us know that it's flutter. In other words, we can't quite see where the R wave, S wave, T wave, where they really are, those, those components are blurred. Typically it's above 200. Um, rates above 250 are not very common. Uh, and if it is above that, it's often suggestive of an accessory bypass tract. So if it's going above 250, uh, we, would, we would often uh, suggest that that's an AVRT, uh, like an antidromic AVRT rather than an a, uh, a V flutter uh, or a VTAC. Um, hemodynamic instability is, is very common in these, in these really fast tachycardias. And so again, you're looking at ventricular flutter here. <clears throat> Bottom picture being VTAC, where you can clearly see various components of, of the cardiac cycle, but in, in ventricular flutter, you cannot see any of those components and it's moving very quickly. Sometimes you have some fusion beats, which we've already talked, that we've already talked about a little bit, where you have um, features of both areas of the ventricles being stimulated. Um, in that morphology, it's, uh, it might have uh, some aspects of a normal QS complex mixed in with the, the weird ventricular beat as well. And that happens anytime we see those two pacemaker sites. So the SA node firing normally, but also a ventricular pace firing. And at some point in time, they, they meet creating a QRS complex that has some characteristics of both a normal QRS complex and the ventricular QRS complex. So, <clears throat> and then again, the capture beats, which we've already talked about, uh, that every once in a while the atria get control over the, the ventricles uh, for a capture beat. Um, fusions and capture beats being present are indicators that we have ventricular tachycardia, all right? So if you see those mixed in, then you, you're, you do have VTAC and not some other supraventricular rhythm with an aberrancy. And again, Brigada's sign and Josephson's sign uh, are telling us that it is also ventricular in nature. Um, in all the precordial leads, if the complex is negative in all those leads, that's also a pretty good indicator that we have VTAC. And just a review of Brigada's and Josephson's signs. Uh, the etiology of ventricular tachycardia and ventricular flutter uh, are usually bad things going on in the heart. So MIs, ischemia, other uh, pathologies of the heart, um, some drugs or, dis or electrolyte disorders as well. We can have a polymorphic ventricular tach tachycardia um, and torsade DuPont. Um, polymor uh, torsade DuPont is a specific type of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Um, so anytime we have uh, a, tach a ventricular tachycardia where the, the corresponding QRS complexes are changing their morphology all the time, then we call it polymorphic VTAC. Uh, and in some cases, it could also be torsade. So in here, again, the, the pacemaking is, front, is, is ventricular in nature. It's often an irregularly irregular rhythm, usually between 150 and 300 beats per minute, and that's typically in the, in the low 200 range. Uh, but the morphology is uh, constantly changing, both in amplitude and polarity. So that means sometimes we're dealing with R waves, sometimes we're dealing with S waves, uh, and the amplitude is, is constantly going up and down. Um, Complexes are always wide and you can't really see some specific components of it. So it's got a, a kind of a V flutter look to it in that sense. Uh, and often the complexes are grouped in some five to 20 complexes per group as they go through a, a change. Um, so in the cartoon here, the, the blue arrow is showing you that we're dealing with S waves on the bottom, T waves on the top, and the pink area is showing you that or you're looking at R waves on the top and T waves on the bottom, uh, often with a PVC that kind of initiates this. And what it bas basically gives you the, the, the mental picture of is a rotisserie, where the QS complexes, the, there's movement of the ectopic focus throughout the ventricles, 
that from a single lead uh, is sometimes the signal is directly at the lead, sometimes it's moving perpendicular, sometimes it's moving away and everywhere in between to that lead. Uh, and so we, we start to see it. Now in a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, we would have a normal QT interval. We haven't talked a lot about QT intervals yet, but we will. Uh, but we have a normal QT interval uh, with, the, with this changeover in QRS complexes, which tells us it's polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Uh, if we have a different QT interval, then our poly polymorphic ventricular tachycardia would be specific to torsades. So with torsades, we have the exact same thing. We have a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. However, um, it is caused because we have a prolonged QT interval. Um, so before the development of the tachycardia, we have a prolonged QT interval. The only way you'd be able to really tell that that's the case is if you saw an area that had um, a normal rhythm where you could actually measure the QT interval. Um, so we talked, we've talked in the past and you've, you've seen as you've been moving into your ACLS stuff that we often give magnesium for torsades because torsades is often caused by a magnesium deficiency, but um, that's only going to work on torsades. If it's a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, the magnesium would not, would not work because it's not caused by the same problem. Um, so knowing whether or not you have a normal QT interval before the torsades would just help to steer uh, a certain treatment one direction or the other. So again, in torsades, you have a prolonged QT interval, and then you have a PVC in the mix that initiates our, our polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that is, um, and a specific strain of that is called torsades. If you have a normal QT interval, then the resulting polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is not torsades, and magnesium would not be the, the drug of choice. Um, we'll go more in depth into QT intervals later, but, um, but we've got QT intervals are not set like PR intervals are or other intervals that we've talked about. Um, so we have to correct them. We have to have what's called a corrected QT interval that is corrected for the rate at which everything is going. Um, so a prolonged uh, QT interval is typically anything more than 0.419 seconds and markedly prolonged is anything over 0.440 seconds. But a general rule is that um, if the patient's not tachycardic, the QT interval should not be more than half the R to R interval. So your QT interval should be shorter than half an R to R interval. If it's greater than half an R to R interval, then we would say it's, it's most likely a prolonged QT interval. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about how to calculate QT intervals um, to know for sure if they're long, but that's a good rule to follow. So when you measure the QT interval, the QT interval starts at the beginning of the QS complex and goes to the end of the T wave. And that should not be more than half of an R to R interval. Um, so if it's more than half an R to R interval, you likely have a prolonged Q QT interval. Um, so sometimes when you see a PVC that pops on top of a, of a T wave, um, then we can start to have some, some issues. And that's one of the things that can lead us to our polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Uh, and then when we see it, uh, again, you're, you're literally seeing the, the movement of ectopic foci throughout the uh, ventricles that from a single lead make it look like you're on a rotisserie of some sort. Right. Because again, we're looking all from one single lead, though it'll look like torsades in all leads. Um, okay, so torsades is associated with prolonged QT intervals, uh, and that's why we, uh, and the reason for that happening often is a magnesium, magnesium deficiency, which is why we give magnesium. Um, and if it's not a prolonged QT interval, then it would just be a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. They look the same um, when you're in the depths of the actual VTAC itself. So um, lots of different things can, uh, 
lead us down the, the path of, of causing it in the end. And then finally, we're at kind of the end of the line with V-fib and asystole. Um, ventricular fibrillation, you, you have a chaotic rhythm that you cannot discern any aspects of the cardiac cycle, or at least any aspects of the ventricular portion of the cardiac cycle. Um, you have no baseline, it's wandering all over the place, um, and this would be cardiac arrest. Um, when we have this, in these undulations that are all over the place, they can be fine or coarse or anywhere in between. Uh, fine V-fib is associated with worse outcomes than coarse V-fibs. Uh, so when we talk about shocking somebody, shocking somebody ha has a higher efficacy when you have a coarse V-fib than when you have a fine V-fib. Um, fine V-fib lets us know that there is less activity on the electrolyte side and is one step closer to a systole. V-fib is created when we have multiple sites all over the ventricles that are all trying to fire themselves off. There's no organized rhythm to it, and it results in no blood flow from the ventricles being moved. And then uh, outside of V-fib, uh, our most stable rhythm actually in all would be a systole. With a systole, we have no electrical activity in the heart that is functioning, um, and so uh, really, this, this truly is kind of the end of the road for them. Every once in a while, we'll have an offshoot of a systole called ventricular standstill, and that's where you might see some atrial activity. You might see some P waves, but no associated QRS complexes at all. Uh, ventricular standstill and a systole are equally bad and, and are, um, can be treated in the exact same way, just as a systole. So the absence of any electrical activity and this is our terminal rhythm. Uh, check your leads, make sure that this is actual if you see it, right? Every once in a while, you'll have what's called an agonal rhythm where you'll see uh, sometimes a, a kind of a bizarre uh, escape, ventricular escape rhythm that's popped in or not rhythm, but in a, in a ventricular escape beat that's popped into it. Um, maybe that is consistent. So maybe it happens every, every so many seconds. Um, it's, it's extraordinarily slow, so it, it's not really an idioventricular rhythm, but every once in a while you have one of these blips that comes in. Uh, it's about as close to a systole as you get without having a systole, uh, and it is equally, it, it's equal to a systole in terms of the way that we, we treat it. It just lets us know that the heart is not quite ready to, to call it quits yet, um, but it's also not organized enough to have any blood flow. And V-fib and asystole, any number of things can lead to it, obviously, right? Uh, this is kind of the end of the road for the heart. Okay, so that's the end of our ventricular rhythms. Uh, that's also the end of the, the current cycle of our EKG for the, the single lead rhythms. We'll start translating this stuff all to 12 lead next term. Um, but these are the ones to start to master and kind of figure out and start to uh, figure out how this all works for you with EKG, and then we'll take all of this and plug it into 12 lead uh, next term. So all of this will, will continue on when we start talking about 12 lead. This is how you start to analyze a 12 lead, and then we'll start adding all the components that we get from 12 lead on top of that. So, all right, I will see you guys shortly. <laughs>